Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is Steve Spector, your host. With me is Rob Hirschfeld, as usual. Rob, good morning. Stephen, hello. Hello. Well, hopefully it's nice and sunny where you are today. It's beautiful up here in Idaho in the summer. So I, I, I can't complain about the weather. And I'm sure down in Austin, it's at least 130, 140 today. I'm actually in uh, uh, Berkeley, California. So. Oh, is, Matthew, is it hot in Berkeley? Today? Is it hot in Berkeley? No, it's not hot in Berkeley. Oh, are you in Austin, uh, Rob? I am in Austin. So 103 today, I think, is the expected. Oof, much too hot. Well, so it's our yeah. guest has Stuff, jumped in. No hoodies <laughs> for me, just T-shirts. <laughs> just... I jumped the gun, sorry. That's okay. So our guest, uh, Matt Trefario, I think I came close. Trefario, yeah. Trefario, yeah, I am, that's all right. <laughs> I am a name killer who is the CMO of Vapor.io, and we've been trying to get Matt on for a few months now, so this is fantastic. We finally tracked him down. So, Matt, if you can give us kind of a short overview of your, of your career without going more than 30, 40 minutes, then we can uh, <laughs> jump in and, and go from there. Thanks a lot for joining. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, touch on the highlights because I think there's, there's two interesting things. You know, I, I got my, my uh, early start actually writing video games, so I was programming on a 6502 um, counting clock cycles, um, talk about real time, and you're actually, you know, tracing the raster beam across the screen to, to change colors and, and animate shapes. So uh, from a very, very deep real time world, using tiny amounts of data, you know, 4K was a lot back in those days, up through personal computers, you know, embedded operating systems, interactive television, and so on. And, and more recently, um, you know, the last, the last uh, uh, six or seven years, I've been on, I've been in the, the software infrastructure side, now on the hardware infrastructure side, but I was a CMO of Heroku for a couple of years, did a tour through Salesforce, and obviously Heroku is all about abstracting infrastructure. And then I was the CMO of Mesosphere, and we created the, the data center operating system, which again, this idea of abstracting hardware. So actually, in my, in my transition to Vapor, um, I've really gone through uh, you know, it, it, almost a full circle in some ways, because now we're dealing very much with the the bits, uh, you know, the hardware components of this, you know, how, how, do you, how do you cool a machine? How do you house a machine? The supply chain logistics about swapping out hardware and you need to, uh, latencies, um, you know, compute and storage and weird locations. And it's really a lot of fun for me, but it's, it's, so it's been an interesting arc of my career. But now I'm the CMO of Vapor. I've been here for about uh, uh, two years now. We're building out the infrastructure and the businesses in edge computing. That's awesome. And we're not going to let you off the hook from deep technical questions with your title, by the way. That's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no mercy when it comes to uh, going deep in edge. So. Yeah, and I was telling you earlier that I, I wore my t-shirt and my hoodie just for you, thinking we might actually uh, be on video. But you'll just have to imagine it. I, I try, try to produce some, some street cred. Uh, and Matt, Matt and I have been, been going back and forth on Twitter. And, and one of the things I, I really appreciate about, about your, your Dr. Edge feed is that you, you find really great material um, all across the spectrum that you know talking about edge the challenges of edge and, and how things go so you are it, you know in the in the total sweet spot of what this this podcast likes to focus on so we're going to have some fun yeah thanks rob and i actually want to say this is one of my favorite podcasts um you know Thank i think you. there's there's very few uh in fact i don't i can't even think of another podcast that that on a regular basis goes deep on edge computing and i think it's potentially one of the most transformational trends in uh, cloud and infrastructure today. So I, I really appreciate it. I mean, I like that you released the podcast over the weekend because I like to listen to podcasts on the weekend and it's just a terrific show you put together. Thank you. We love to hear that. Um, and and along, along those lines, right, this is that I, I totally agree that the way we're building infrastructure at the edge is not what we've done in cloud. It's different. Applications are going to be different, right? Every, every conversation I have, we learn that in deeper and deeper ways. And so this is one of the things I want to really dig in with you is to, to take that, that idea and have you pull it apart, right? You know, you've, you've thought this through, give us your definition of edge and, and why it is so different. Why is, why is this transformational compared yeah, to I, I appreciate you uh, laying a landmine right in front of me. So, so let's acknowledge at the out front that there are many definitions of edge. Um, I don't even think that's, that's, that's uh, controversial. Um, a lot of them are bad. Um, some of them are good, but let, let me posit that the edge that we care about, meaning the group of people that are on this call, the group of people that listen to this call, the edge that we care about is the edge of the last mile network. 
And I think one of the ways people get confused is they think that edge is a thing, when in fact it's actually a place. So you think of that last mile network and whether it's the you know, wireless signal from the cell tower to my cell phone or it's the, um, the cable from my, my Comcast head end uh, to my, my, my modem in my closet, that last mile network um, has two sides. It's got a device side, which is sort of on the downstream, and it's got an infrastructure side. Now, there are lots of overlaps and blendings and gray areas, but I think from a, uh, at a relatively coarse level, that's an extremely useful definition of edge. I think once you disambiguate the infrastructure side from the device side, you can have all kinds of more productive conversations. So, you know, one example is, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft has this uh, really spectacular program around their Azure IoT uh, product, and they call it an edge product. And what is, is essentially is pushing some cloud management capabilities onto the device side of the network today running on customer owned equipment, which is very uncloud like, but it has some of the cloud control plane. Um, I think that's a really interesting use of edge computing. And by the way, let's, let's step up one level and just all agree that edge computing is about moving compute storage and network capacity closer to the end user or device. I think that's- So that's, so that's, that's, that, that's what I would consider the latency argument for edge, that, that, that latency, ends up being the driving, the driving component for the definition? Well, it's, it's a little more than that. It's, it's so latency is a big part of it. So there's, you know, when we get into machine to machine communication, we start measuring um, response times in milliseconds instead of, you know, hundreds of milliseconds, ones of seconds, tens of seconds. But, but it's also, um, you know, there's a, there's a data locality component to it where you want certain workloads to run in a, in a certain area because that's where the data is stored or that's where the data is being ingested. So it's not all about latency. Some of it is about you know, data ingestion, data reduction, compute offloading. There's a lot of really interesting use cases there. Um, but I, I think that, uh, so I think that's an important distinction to make. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm gonna, and there's, we, did a, we did a great podcast with Dave McQuarrie talking about the data gravity aspect of this. And I, I think you're right. And we've, we've had some more recent ones where we're, we're trying to talk about data locality is, is, a, big, is a big deal on this. Late, latency is a big deal. And also, um, you know, jitter, which is a, a, you know, some people think of it as a, a subset of latency, but it's actually pretty different. Um, you know, there's a set of use cases where not only jitter? Do be jitter. Wait, wait. Yeah. yeah, jitter. Right. Oh, okay. Got it. So, so, so explain why that's, why that's a component. Yeah, so, so there's, there's a whole set of ap applications where, um, you, in addition to having a quick response time, you need kind of a guaranteed level to it. And, you know, whether you're controlling a, a robotic lathe or um, providing decision support to an autonomous vehicle, a lot of those workloads need a, a not only relatively low latency, but they need sort of guaranteed latencies. And once you get onto a network um, like the internet backbone, we're using, uh, you know, best effort routing, you know, not, not all hops are equal, and sometimes you have more hops than you can control. And so the, the variance between, you know, one signal and the next signal, um, you know, isn't, isn't is, you can't count on it. You can't count on it being consistent. And there's a set of workloads where you really want that consistency. So I think jitter is an important component that people don't think about a lot. Latency, data sovereignty, you know, there's some applications where the, the data, you actually don't want the data to leave. A lot of it's just, uh, you know, cost. Uh, data is expensive to, to ship, particularly over uh, legacy legacy backhaul networks. You know, you think about, you know, I I have uh, Comcast cable, and I'm I'm always surprised that I get a you know 160 gigabits per second downstream, and I get like five upstream, and that's because the cable plant was built asymmetrically, and there's a lot of legacy networks that are going to take decades to replace. Uh, if we actually want to replace them, where we actually want to relieve the the upstream pressure because there isn't enough there's enough bandwidth to, to even send the data back. The, the wireless network is a, is a great example of this. So one of the things we can do with edge computing is we can, we can offload that data from that backhaul network and either put it on a direct fiber link or just process it locally. And that removes a lot of the congestion from the network and eliminates you know, uh, expensive plant upgrades that maybe can be deferred or avoided. So part of the way you're defining edge and describing the infrastructure here is, is I think important, it's, it's, a, it's a theme we, we see, is that the applications, the applications that we see for the edge are not 
you know, traditional user watches a web page, user watches a video thing. These are machine actions or these are intermachine actions where, you know, it's, it's much more of a, of a, it's a, it's a whole, and this comes back to the transformation. It's a different communication pattern. It's different things communicating to each other. It's not just a, you know, a person waiting for a, a, a round trip from a client server application. Is that a fair? Yeah, it is. I mean, so, so let me, let's tease that apart because I actually think that's, that's really interesting. So there's this pretty coarse delta between human scale latencies. Your human, you know, you think about like a, like, you know, 60 frames per second on my video, right? It, it looks like a continuous stream to me. And that's because my brain functions at, you know, sort of one sixtieth of a second, right? That's how my optical nerves assemble information. And so anything faster than that, to me, it doesn't matter. To, to a human, it doesn't matter. To a machine, you know, a, the 60th of a second is, is glacial, right? <laughs> that's a, that's a, lot of, a lot of time. And so you're absolutely right that, that a lot of the, you know, you, th you think about some of the projections of, you know, th by 2022, 30 plus billion IP connected devices. I mean, that's just a gigantic number. The bulk of those are going to be generating data. Um, some of that data can be quite large, uh, video streaming, that sort of thing. So a, a lot of this, a lot of the, the machines that are being put into the field are going to require these low latencies, you know, whether it's an autonomous vehicle, a drone, a car, um, whether it's you're actually controlling a subsystem in the cellular network. Um, there's a whole interesting side to edge computing that's just about making the cellular infrastructure work. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, <laughs> Anything's an improvement from where, where we stand. I, I have a, so, and, and that's going to take us ultimately to 5G, which I want to talk about. But before we get there, utopia you're describing, and I, I, I do think it's a utopia of all these edge devices working together and sharing information. That's, that's not a single vendor my, you know, Utopia to me doesn't include that all being Amazon.com devices that you have bought from a single vendor and they're all sort of wired together for you because it's, it's from one place. How do you see this emerging as a multi-vendor data sharing environment? Because we, we can't backhaul all, all of that data you just described isn't going to get backhauled to a, a cloud and then zipped across cloud to cloud and then back to another place. We've got to share all this data that was being generated locally. That's that's a key, right? That's part of your definition. How does how do we how do we get there? How, what are the challenges for that? Let me get about the best way to answer that. Um, so so we actually I have actually a pretty strong opinion uh, about this. The way that I see the the edge um, infrastructure being built out. So I see edge devices increasing exponentially, and I also see that in part driving compute storage and networking moving to the edge of the infrastructure side of the last mile network. Um, in, in the particular example of what Vapor is doing, you know, we're putting um, 150 kilowatts, which on compute scale is pretty substantial. I mean, that is, that is, that is, you know, 20 traditional IT racks at five to 10 kilowatts a rack. And we're putting those at either the base of a cell tower or in a tower aggregation hub, you know, one, you know, a, a one shed that connects to, you know, 20 to 50 towers. And we'll go into a city and we'll put, you know, five to seven of these things. So you think about seven 150 kilowatt data centers at the base of a cell tower or an aggregation hub spread. Uh, you know, imagine, imagine take a city like Chicago, which is the first deployment city you're doing and draw, draw a circle around the major metropolitan area and then identify, you know, seven spots along the perimeter of that circle that are 10 to 15 kilometers apart. So, you know, a few microseconds, uh, a few milliseconds, excuse me, of, of uh, latency between them. Put 150 kilowatts in each of those locations, connect them together with high-speed redundant fiber. And what do you have? Well, you have almost a megawatt of compute, which is a pretty substantial, you know, data center approaching hyperscale. You also have a, what looks like a virtual data center to a developer that has seven availability zones. Um, and so you can see a model where a developer is deploying a set of services, containers, serverless functions into a virtual data center that spans an entire city, providing certain, you know, uh, SLAs, quality service requirements, location requirements, cost requirements to a scheduler. Uh, and that schedule will say, you know, imagine, a, you know, a, a, an addition to, you know, extension to the Kubernetes schedule. I actually know people that are building these uh, where where you, you hand it a workload with a set of requirements and it figures out where in those seven availability zones to, to run it. Now, when you have that, that model of, of a data center existing on the edge, you say, okay, well, whose equipment is in there and who, where's this stuff running? 
So our model is this is shared infrastructure, right? This is co-location space. That's our business model. And the kinds of tenants that will be in that co-location space are the kinds of tenants that are tr in traditional co-location space. So every one of those cloud providers, I believe, will put equipment in our co-location data centers. So if you're a customer of Amazon or a customer of Microsoft or a customer of Google, they will provide you with edge infrastructure deployment scenarios and each of them will do it a little different you know one of them may offer you know edge vms for a premium so i can actually buy a vm on the edge others will do um you know they'll build it into their iot uh, their iot chain um others may do it only with serverless or with uh, container orchestrators but each of the cloud providers will have will push their cloud out of their hyperscale data centers push a subset of it well actually pushing out of it is probably not the me right metaphor because it's additive you know, this whole idea that the edge is going to destroy the cloud is just complete wow. nonsense, but, right? It's, those hyperscale sure. centers aren't going to go right. there. Wait, 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 hold on. Hold on. There's, there's, you just said so much. I, we have to untangle this. <laughs> That's love, I'm sorry. Okay, the, so I'll pause. No, this is, this, is, this is great. This is great. The, the idea that you're going, you know, Amazon's going to have to invest in, you know, hundreds of thousands of edge infrastructures within mill, millisecond um, latencies of other data centers to create these regions, which is very logical, I, I, right? But then it's going to be, you know, there's a couple of, of vendors who are going to have that. It's a huge real estate problem. It's mind blowing from if I'm a developer, right? Yeah, you're talking about you know, seven uh, zones inside of Chicago, but now I have to be aware that I have a customer who needs to be in one of those zones inside of Chicago and I need to, you know, sort of shoot my app over to them that you know that doesn't seem like a practical problem i'm going to be tracking hundreds of thousands of, of amazon data centers and figuring out where to put my applications even if kubernetes is good about you know moving me within that that region and to different kubernetes zones the idea of having to track that from a customer you know manage my customers and geos is stunningly hard it's, do you see do you see some some help for that? Yeah. Or, I mean, or maybe I'm overestimating the problem. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, now, now I've got to unpack your statement. Right? <laughs> so it is, it is a fairly complex problem in its, in its full uh, maturation. But let's step back a little because edge computing at that scale already exists today. It's called Akamai. All right, Akamai manages 240,000 servers in 170 countries. Um, and those servers primarily, you know, cache downstream content, um, but they also can run you know, very limited compute, kind of in some ways like the, the precursor to serverless, right? You can actually be an Akamai customer and run compute workloads. And now Cloudflare is in that business. There are companies that with their own private solution have solved big chunks of this problem. I mean, in, in a way, the edge computing that I'm talking about is, is reverse CDN. Uh, well, it's CDN plus compute plus bidirectional. But the, in terms of like how you manage that many remote lights out servers, how you get them deployed, how you rack and stack them, how you replace them when they, when, when they need to be replaced, like a lot of that complexity has been worked out and there are suppliers that will actually solve those problems, us being one of them. On the other side, from a software standpoint, there are a lot of companies, a lot of venture funded companies and a lot of large companies uh, from General Electric to, to the cloud providers themselves that are building software tools to solve this problem. Where you, you know, as a software developer, I don't necessarily have to get down, deep down into the weeds. I can define a service. I can define the, the requirements for that service. I mean, think about building, building you know, deploying a, a, a Kubernetes pod, right? You, you can give it some affinity and anti-affinity rules. Well, this is just, you know, this is just more criteria. Say this workload needs to run within, you know, n milliseconds of this device, this location, has to have this level of reliability, and a scheduler will actually figure out how to place that workload for you. Um, and there are companies building, building that technology and making it available as, as, in some cases, open source, but in some cases, private source. So I'm I'm well, I'm not trying to, I'm not going to be able to solve that problem. I think a lot of there's certainly a lot of companies that are that are stepping up to solve that problem. I would love to get people who are who have those solutions proprietary or not on the show and talk about how they're doing it because I 
I agree with what you're talking about architecturally. I have not seen generally available people building those platforms yet in ways that they're public. And you and I are, are in overlap, but not completely overlap circles. And so what you're describing, I think, has to happen. Yeah. Well, you've actually had one of them on your show, uh, uh, Cheating from Macrometa. Uh, is building, yeah, you know, yes. just, just, I mean, actually, I don't know if I could tell you what he's building, but he's, uh, I, he's well, and, and, and people should, people should go back and listen to that show because he gave, uh, you know, a, a fair bit of detail on, on how and what he thought. And, and so you're right. And, and I think that a lot of us are seeing this problem. And so what, you know, what I, and what I'm having fun talking about right now is defining what that problem is. I, I think your vision of having schedulers that you know can be latency sensitive and move workloads for you because right now the schedulers are, are, are pretty basic right they, they, they they're focused on keeping applications up not keeping applications fast and what we're describing is taking the latency and the the jitter and and being sensitive to those things from a scheduling perspective I think that's exciting the data has to flow with that. Um, and we've had some guests who talk about being able to you know, move or migrate data. And, and I'd love to talk about more because the data is the other side of this. You can't just move the compute. So there, there's clearly these, these, these components happening. Does it have to be an Amazon, Google, you know, Microsoft, you know, pick, you know, you get, you get your, your uh, Neapolitan ice cream at the edge and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the reason I brought them up as examples w was really to point out if you're a, if, if you're already a customer of one of those companies, you will see extensions to their capabilities to run workloads with the kind of criteria that I, that we've just described, you know, to specify latencies, geolocation, you know, things like that. So that was really to say, look, this is the edge is actually the edge infrastructure is an extension of the cloud. And it will be literally by the cloud providers extended. But there will be, there will be third parties. There will be private uh, entities. Think about anybody uh, that runs their own web scale data centers. You know, the Facebooks of the world, Snapchats of the world, you know, anybody looking for, for low latency, new emergent companies that want to do that. So they'll, they'll be tenants in these edge locations. You know, industrial IoT companies, General Electric is a good example. You know, they're likely to be tenants in these kinds of locations. So no, I don't think it's going to be limited to the, the major cloud providers, but I think it will resemble the kind of market share components that we see today, right? I mean, it'll, it'll be dominated by, by the cloud providers. I mean, I think the, the telcos are going to try to make a play here. And it's, it's you know, certainly there's a, there's a whole set of applications that the wireless networks need that actually need to be tightly integrated to the network. Then there's a set of applications that will probably use those facilities. So I'll give an example. So yeah, vi video caching, both downstream and upstream and video bandwidth management is huge. I mean, I saw a figure from AT&T that since 2007, the, the growth in uh, video traffic on their network has been 250,000%, <laughs> which, which <laughs> is, is quite an astounding number. And today that's mostly downstream, but tomorrow it might be upstream. You know, imagine all of us walking around with these 8K video cameras. So where's that data going to go? How is and, it going to- In an augmented, and, and just to give people a very concrete example, in an augmented reality perspective, you're constantly broadcasting your video stream, your personal perspective stream. In, in, in augmented in, in yeah. uh, cars, right? You know, there's there's a lot of places where the need to send stream, you know, video streams up becomes very high for very legitimate reasons. Yeah, and down continues to grow too. I think uh, you know, augmented and virtual reality is a great example. In fact, this actually ties back to one of the early points that that we didn't quite finish with, which was human latency versus machine latency. So let's imagine an augmented reality application. I mean, a really practical one. So I've talked to people that you know, the building industry, architects and and builders, and one of the the big challenges is the architects and engineers uh, monitoring actual build and comparing it to plan. So actual to plan. Because if you make a mistake, if you pour concrete before you've got a pipe laid, it could be a you know, multi-million dollar mistake. And so there's this, this very real effort to monitor the, you know, imagine a skyscraper or a bridge, monitoring its, its build to make sure there are no mistakes and it actually matches plan. So one of, the, one of the applications that excites the engineers and the architects is imagine if you go out to a job site 
put on a pair of lightweight, tetherless, <laughs> augmented reality glasses, um, and you know, walk around the site and compare plans to to build. And that's a dreamy application. Well, how, how do you actually deliver that? And, and, and but wait, I want to break in for just a second yeah. and, and interrupt your stream through with two things. One is for listeners, the thing to search if you want more information on that is Digital Twin. We, we just, uh, Simon Crosby talked about this in, in a previous show, and um, it's, it's worth understanding Digital Twin for that process. But you don't it's need not goggles. You can, you Hold can on, do I just it. want to say, Rob, the Simon Crosby podcast will come out after this one. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> So, so stay tuned uh, for that one. It's going to be great. Oh my God, uh, that's overwhelming. And, and I, I don't, I can't get the sequences straight. The other thing that that is is noted, I've seen some really compelling demos AR that don't require a headset, where what you're describing can be done using a, a tablet or a phone. That's and true. A camera on the phone, and so yeah. what what I don't want people to do is say, ah, oh, that's yeah, yeah, you know, I want my 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 headset's going to show up my AR headset's going to show up with my jetpack. No, this, <laughs> this is technology that, that is available today on phones where you can take a digital twin and overlay it to an actual system, right? Google done some interesting mapping. But yeah, when Matt's describing this stuff, these are immediate value dollars applications that don't require specialized hardware, that just get, get much more compelling <laughs> with the specialized hardware. But they're ready to go. So, all right, so sorry, Matt. Keep yeah, going. that's true. And and the reason I was I was sort of fast forwarding to the to the wireless headset is uh, I wanted to introduce a point around compute and latency and data. So, you know, tetherless. You put a VR. I mean, a, a really high quality VR goggles on, and you've got this this cable the size of my forearm that plugged into some you know massive gaming machine, right? That I can't carry anywhere. Or I've got to wear some some crazy backpack or something. Well, obviously, we don't want any of that in the future world. You want to be able, you want to have long battery life, you want to be able to reduce the cost, and yet you want to have this really high quality experience. Well, I think in order to do that, you've got to pull a lot of the rendering, uh, a lot of the local, the, the, put a lot of the compute into the infrastructure. That's how you increase battery life, that's how you increase rendering quality and speed. So in that environment, you've got, imagine you've got two, you know, 4K or 8K uh, stereoscopic Im images, Generating that on the infrastructure uh, is relatively trivial. Generating it on the local device at real-time speed is with you know, some sort of reasonable weight that I'm willing to carry around and some sort of reasonable uh, amount of battery life um, it, it is unlikely to happen anytime soon. I mean, so, so I think there's a whole set of applications that are going to need to have this high-speed local compute. You've got to be generating those frames at 60, 70 times per second, or else you're going to make people sick. Um, you obviously need a high enough bandwidth network, which is really where we get into 5G and these, these you know, very high-speed, uh, low-latency you know, wireless networking technologies. But you can see pretty clearly how those trends are going to converge and why the infrastructure compute is going to be so important in delivering those capabilities. I, I agree with you. And then the, the thing I would, go, I would take even one step further is yet that augmented view that you're describing is, is sort of a one app view. But we want to move into a place where your, your field of view is, is a, is a multi-data source space. And so it's not just that I'm, I'm you know, looking at overlaying building plans. Ideally, you're going to be pulling in specs or data or sensors from other, you know, that are local in your environment directly from the sensors in your environment, not today where they are today, which is client servered up to a cloud. Yes, um, that's right. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this, this is a very different problem. In today, you know, when we deal with client server, we, we, the, the, all of that horizontal traffic typically happens in a cloud environment and it's not that latency sensitive, or if it is, we just push everything to US West <laughs> and, <laughs> right. and, and say it's good enough. We don't get away with that here. I, I'm gonna shift a little bit towards the 5G question. And then I'm, I, I think that that brings in some of what Vapor's doing. We, we hear a lot about 5G, 5G is important. How do we figure out, you know, how, how important is it? I guess we should start there. Well, wow, that's a great question. Well, I mean, I think it unlocks transformational capabilities. I mean, I think the idea that we've got autonomous robots um, that are uh, untethered, that we've got 
millions, tens of millions of sensors, uh, all contributing data to that's being analyzed in real time. Uh, I, I think that you're gonna, we're going to need much, much higher capacity, much lower latency networks in order to deliver that, that world. Do you think that, does that mean that 5G becomes a business requirement for, right? It's not just the cell phone companies saying, oh, we have, you know, we're going to sell you the next, you know, the iPhone XX <laughs> and, uh, sorry, to be t- <laughs> 11, I don't, they don't call it X. The idea here is it's not just about selling you a new, a new phone for these applications. There's actually going to be commercial overlays where people are going to be saying, you know, hurry up, lay, lay more 5G towers. Do you, do you see that as a commercial imperative? Is it going to be paid for by somebody besides the person holding the device? I guess I don't understand the question. It, it, what do you mean paid for by the person holding the so device? I guess when, when, I look at, when I look at the 5G imperative, yeah. Because I, I have conversations with people and there's some people who think 5G is going to change the world and it's going to, it's going to be everywhere and, and you know, outside of the U.S., the U.S. is going to get leapfrogged because everybody wants to move into this new infrastructure. From my perspective, that's, you know, the things that have pulled the, the new generations to technology have not been necessarily commercial interests. Correct me if I'm wrong. But with 5G, what you're describing is actually... Car, autonomous car fleet saying, I can't run cars in your city unless you have 5G, uh, a, a real 5G mesh all over that city. And all of a sudden now you have a commercial incentive for people to bring in the new technology instead of just, you know, I can sell you the new phone. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. I, I think that, that um, I mean, w- one of the things that's, that's been a pretty radical change in the wireless industry is, I mean, remember, the wireless industry was created to, for voice, right? For analog voice. Now, I mean, I don't remember the last time I used the voice app on my phone. Right? I mean, you and I are talking on, you know, on, on, across you know, digitized TCP IP packets right now. So the, so the telephone networks have become data networks. That transformation has been driven, has, has been driven by, by commercial, I mean, sort of economic terms, right? It's been all our personal, a lot of our personal usages, usage in our, our phones and our Alexa devices and, you know, all those capabilities. And I think this next generation is going to be driven not so much by our phones, but by these other devices that require low latency, continuous connectivity. And I, I think it's going to happen over time. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of, of these edge compute, low latency applications that can be delivered over uh, LTE networks, uh, which are pretty prevalent in the United States and other countries. You know, those are pretty, pretty high speed and there's some, some really clever things you can do. I think there's a lot of trends in the wireless industry that benefit from uh, edge computing just in the infrastructure. So 5G, if every, if all four or maybe three now of the major tel telephone, wireless telephone carriers in the U.S. all have to independently upgrade their networks to 5G. I just don't think there's enough money to do that. So I think the inevitable thing that's going to happen is there's going to be this increased trend towards shared infrastructure. So today, the wireless industry has largely divested of its towers. Um, There's there's 200,000 cell towers in the U.S., and I think like 90% of them are owned by two companies. One of them is Crown Castle, one of our partners, owns 45,000 cell towers, uh, mostly in the large metropolitan areas. They also have uh, 65,000 miles of fiber, a dense metro fiber, connecting those, those cell towers. So there's this incredible shared infrastructure owned by companies that are essentially REITs that are looking for ways to to add value to the existing real estate and infrastructure they already own. Um, and that's one of the things you mentioned that edge computing is a real estate problem. It is a real estate problem. And it is very hard to accumulate that kind of real estate in metropolitan areas. It's very expensive. There's a lot of uh, entitlement and permitting that has to happen. I mean, Crown Castle has a team of 300 people that just do the, the permitting and the community relations piece of, of, of that. And, and this- what, what you're describing is one of the reasons why I think from a public cloud perspective, where they're used to dealing with the tens of data centers in hyperscale and switching into small things with hundreds of thousands, you know, footprint of hundreds of thousands is a very different, it's a very different business model, it's a different management model. Just for, for people, um, there's, there's a broader industry trend that you alluded to that is worth mentioning parenthetically here. You use the term REIT, which is a real estate trust in the last five years, 
the data center business has shifted from being a IT business financially to being a, a real estate business where the ta there were tax benefits created by using a REIT structure to, to build data centers. And so what's, what's fascinating here is, and, and there's a subtlety that we're, I don't want to dive into because it's going to take too long. It's actually, I, I should bring in one of my colo people and we'll have a whole podcast. Even we should do a whole podcast on the REIT structure for data centers and, and how it's transforming business. So let me, let me end that parentheses. Matt, we're, we're talking about thousands of systems. We're talking about parties who haven't really played or played visibly in this. How do we build all that infrastructure? What is it? What is, how do we manage it, build it, build it? What's, what's holding us back from building this distributed edge mesh wireless technology? Well, I don't think anything's holding us back. I mean, that's my opinion. We're building it right now. We, we've got partnerships with companies that look to deploy capital all day long. Deploying capital in the form of shared infrastructure is something that they're used to, rather than just you, having... Meaning, meaning, meaning for you, cell towers are shared infrastructure, right? You have one tower, you have multiple carriers. That's right. Share, share towers are cell infrastructure. Well, in fact, I think... So I, I want to pick up that point that I, that I was, I was uh, going down, which is... The cell towers are shared infrastructure today, meaning and you look at any given tower, there's probably, you know, a two to five tenants on that tower, each at a different <laughs> vertical layer with their own antennas, right? So they, so they share the tower, but they have their own antennas. At the base of that tower uh, is probably, what they, probably a set of what they call baseband units. Uh, so there's an antenna and a baseband unit, and that's what creates the RF radio signal. And then the baseband unit connects back, you know, to the the telco infrastructure and back to the central office and, and so on. And what's happening is there's the baseband unit is being virtualized. A lot of the things in, in the cellular infrastructure are being virtualized, but the baseband unit is the first thing that's being virtualized. And so they're moving to what's called, first of all, centralized RAN. So they take the baseband unit away from the cell tower and they move it back to a DAS hub or a central office. They have a, a, usually a fiber link to the tower, and, but they still have this proprietary piece of hardware, this baseband unit that's made by a Nokia or an Ericsson or whatnot. That baseband unit is now being virtualized because, I mean, it's essentially, it's an, it's an ARM or an x86 computer inside of a box that you, you buy from a Nokia or an Ericsson. And so the telco companies have put a lot of pressure on the structures to say, look, we're going to pay you for your proprietary, you know, really hard RF engineering transmission equipment, but the, the compute workloads, we want to run them on white box servers. The equipment manufacturers have relented. They've agreed to go down this path and sell software that the Verizons and the, the sprints of the world can run on white box servers. So now that you've, you've run software that's controlling the key part of the wireless infrastructure on white box servers, do you have to actually own those servers? And that's one of the big questions facing the, the telcos today. The history of the telcos, depending on which operator you talk to, they're sort of, you know, depending on where they, you know, their, their legacy thinking, some of them feel they need to own it all. Others are like, look, we don't actually want to own it all. We want to deploy our capital uh, building differentiated servers. We'd be happy to lease, you know, bare metal from Packet. Uh, which is one of our partners, by the way, and I know you know them pretty well. We're and big fans. Lisa, yeah. by the hour, the week, or the month, run our virtualized network functions, including our, our virtualized baseband units, on your bare metal servers um, in all these locations. So we don't have to buy the IT equipment. We don't have to buy the rack and enclosure system. We don't have to build the air conditioning units. We don't have to build the redundant fire power. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We can actually just buy it like we buy you know, cloud services today. And I think that that's going to create a really interesting dynamic in the rollout of 5G, where it's going to become much more competitive because the, the, the business dynamics are going to change. There are going to be companies that decide to deploy their capital differently, use other people's money to roll out infrastructure. And ultimately, what's going to happen is I think you're going to see what looks like a data center, a micro data center in these key locations that's going to have equipment that is running Verizon's workloads and Sprint workloads, and it's going to have equipment that's running Google workloads and equipment that's running Microsoft workloads, and those are all going to be co-located in the same physical space, but operated by, by different entities. In fact, I'd actually, I actually predict that, that within the next five or six years, at least one of the wireless carriers in the U.S. will partner with an existing cloud provider, a public cloud provider, to run their virtualized network functions on that cloud provider's cloud in those edge locations. 
Wow. All right. So Matt, that's your vision. I, I love I love what you're describing. I, I love how you're describing it, right? This is the, the cloud model shared infrastructure is coming to the edge. We're gonna have it's a there's real estate and then there's vendors, you know, multi-tenanted next to each other. But I have yes. to put a period and a, lot in of, it. a lot of <laughs> a lot of competition and a lot of competition drives innovation. So we but we have to we have to have a period. I, we haven't, I, I want you to take a minute and describe what Vapor does because, <laughs> right, you, you have this incredibly powerful framework. You've teased us a little bit about it, but we don't have much time left. So I'm going to put you on the spot to do to explain Vapor helps to, to help us sort of close out this episode. Yeah, happy to. And I actually want to tell a, a fun little ant- anecdote about Vapor. So Vapor was, was founded by Cole Crawford, who, uh, you know, was one of the founders of OpenStack and also was... Um, ran the Open Compute Foundation for a number of years. He started a company with, with, a, with a, a vision of building a new kind of very high density, remotely manageable rack and containment system, right? <laughs> like, like this is just like literally like something that holds c- compute architecture. And what's fun about it is- so, somewhere, it's, somewhere between a cross, a bit, a cross between a donut and a spaceship. Yeah, this. well, so, so, so the thing that's fun about this, the fun story about this is Cole is actually, he's, a, he's a, um, an amateur competitive skydiver and he practices in these vertical wind tunnels. I don't know if you've ever seen these things, but he, he, was, he was thinking about this and saying, well, wh- why don't we use these to cool data centers? Like we, we spend all this time pushing air east-west when it actually wants to go up and down. And in fact, if you do it in a, in a, circular, a, a circular configuration, you can actually get the, you know, the Venturi effect and the Bernoulli principle uh, to you know, evacuate air much more efficiently. He hired some engineers and uh, they designed this mechanical, piece of mechanical equipment with some pretty clever software called the vapor chamber, which is, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, it's a circle, it's a, it's a cylinder. It's nine feet in diameter and about seven feet tall. It has six racks around the perimeter. And these, um, they're, they're wedge-shaped, but they're, they hold traditional IT equipment. You know, they get 19-inch equipment or Open 19 or OCP type equipment. Although they, they sort of taper to the back, they, you know, they hold the standard equipment. The, there's a, there's a, a 22,000 CFM fan at the top. There's like 90 sensors in there, air pressure sensors, temperature sensors, and a bunch of software that runs on this. And the, the, the end result is that system cools Data, data center, IT equipment, much more efficiently than a- anything else we've seen outside of the large-scale hyper, hyperscale companies that have these you know, very, very bespoke systems uh, in their, their large-scale data centers. Nobody's done it at this footprint. Nobody said, look, we can get 150 kilowatts in nine feet diameter. Uh, and again, I, that's about 20 traditional IT racks. So that was the origin of the company, was building the, you know, designing and engineering and building the intellectual property around this. The original vision of the company was that we're going to sell these to, to people building uh, not only traditional data centers, but also edge data centers that where this can be run in a lights out environment. It can be very dense, very highly efficient. And what happened is um, about a year and a half ago, they performed a partnership with Crown Castle. Crown Castle, as I mentioned earlier, is the largest owner of shared wireless infrastructure in the U.S., you know, 45,000 cell towers and 65,000 uh, miles of fiber. And they're a REIT. They don't operate data centers. But they have a lot of real estate assets like fiber, access to the, to the wireless network, and so on. So our partnership, our business has shifted from being essentially this intellectual property company that designed these, these really you know, pretty badass uh, rack and containment systems and standalone you know, container, you know, micromodular data centers for these edge locations into a co-location company. So we are now in the process of deploying dozens and soon hundreds of these 150 kilowatt data centers in major metropolitan areas. Chicago is the first city that we started talking about. We're already live in two locations in Chicago, and our vision is to get to five or seven in the next six, six to eight months. Uh, we expect to be in 100 locations you know, towards the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. So we've got a very aggressive uh, rollout plan. Again, our model is you know, deploy three to seven of these um, in a ring in a major metropolitan area, connect them with high-speed redundant fiber in a software-defined networking configuration. Our business, and we call that the kinetic edge, by the way, that's our, that's our description for this sort of ring of, of, you know, this ring of physical micro data centers that have been assembled into this you know, city-scale virtual data center. And our customers are you know, the, the top 100 purchasers of Intel chipsets, more or less. You know, these, the large companies, whether they run a private cloud or a public cloud, 
that are uh, deploying, you know, uh, IT, IT equipment at scale. And then the, the telcos, because there's a whole set of applications just for virtualizing the telco network that need low latency. You know, you want to operate the radio access network, you, you've got to be within a couple milliseconds. White box server has to be within a couple millise uh, milliseconds of the, the hardware baseband unit. So that's our business. Our business is edge co-location. Matt, this is Steve Spector. It's my turn to come in. And as uh, Rob always likes to say, I, I give him the dirty stare that we're at the time limit. <laughs> but since we don't have video on, you can't see me. Maybe we should- Yeah, make it, make it the slash, can, the finger oh, slash. I, 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 can, I, can, I can feel it. I, I get it telepathically. It's, it, it's there. I, I think we'll start doing video and I'll hold up big signs and you know five minutes and warning and things like that. That might be fun. But Matt, uh, you know, we appreciate you coming on. Great content today. If people were interested in following up, learning more about uh, you know, Vapor, yourself, or um, Rob also mentioned that you guys have an event. Any promotions or anything like that we can do for you? So Vapor.io is our, our company website. The uh, co-location business is, uh, we actually call it Volatus, and that's the partnership with Crown Castle, and that's at Volatus.io. It's a kind of cloud. It's a new kind of cloud, V-O-L-U-T-U-S. Uh, Anybody that has interest in edge computing in general or talking about co-location in these, these metropolitan edge locations, we'd be happy to talk to them. Great. Well, thanks again. And, and Rob, thanks for, uh, you know, asking all the tough questions. And we appreciate it, Matt. And, and as we said, uh, in the middle of this, the Simon Crosby podcast is going to take me a little longer to get ready to push out. So this will come first. So it's one of those stay tuned. Matt, again, thanks for participating. And definitely, I think it's six months, we'll have to uh, bring you back on because this is going to change so fast. But I think we'll, we might look back in six months and go, well, this is what we thought, but here's where we are. And I think it would be useful to do that. Yeah, that'd be great. And I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you. And to our listeners, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And like I always say, if you're a guest you're looking for some content, you know, shoot Rob or myself an email and we're happy to bring those people on. Thanks a lot.